Devoted City. Good morning. If you're joining us online or if you're at the Cary campus, good morning. So good to see you. Let's give it up for everybody at the Cary campus and online. That's right. That's right. My name is Crockett Davidson. Yes, that is my real name. My parents were rebels. I don't know what they were thinking, but that is my real name. I've known Donnie and Devoted City for probably 15 years. I've spoken here before. I follow you guys afar online. I've watched what God has done. And let me tell you what, you have one of the best lead pastors in the country. And let me just tell you what, I mean, ministry is a thankless job. So whether you're a carry, whether you're here, can we give it up for Donnie and just the staff team? We are in a series in Proverbs where we're looking at these wise words. And Proverbs 21 talks about how every man's going to go his own way and do what's right in his own, in his own eyes, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so what we're gonna look at today is where is our hearts? C.S., I mean, uh, Dr. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, that Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. And so we are going to ask some really tough questions and how we're being discipled and the ways that we're following Jesus. And hopefully through today, you're gonna see some practical ways in where you sit. Hopefully, you're gonna see not only where you sit, but you're gonna see where your family members sit. Hopefully, not only are you gonna see where your family members sit, you're gonna see where your neighbors and your friends and maybe some life group leaders and people in your life groups where they sit. Now, here's what I'm asking you today. Don't get too legalistic on me, okay? Uh, you, can, you can migrate from chair to chair. You may start in chair one. You may go to chair two. You may go from chair three all the way to chair one. You may go from two to one or from two to three. The, the question is, where are we in our relationship with Jesus where are we migrating and what is God calling us to do? What are the next steps that God is wanting us to take? So are you ready to dive in? Say, I'm ready. ready. Carrie Campus, let's hear I'm ready. All right, great. All right, so when you think of chair one, I want you to think of this word. I want you to think of the word commitments. You see, these are the people who are committed to the Lord. They love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. They are committed to his mission. Uh, they have the godly habits that we so often talk about. They're praying without ceasing. They're thinking about the Lord. They're, they're, they're giving generously, not only financially, but of their time and their talents. They're committed to the church. They're committed to the mission of God. They're committed to the Lord. I mean, these people have counted the cost of discipleship and they are willing to pay the price. So when you think about people who sit in chair one, I want you to think of the word commitment. When you think of the people in chair two, it's a different word. I want you to think of the word compromise. You see, people in chair two, they have compromised their relationship with the Lord. And so everything kind of comes back to the past. And maybe their relationship with the Lord has faded or it's not as strong as it once was. Maybe they grew up in church. Maybe they had an experience at VBS. Maybe they went to college. And when they went to college, they were a part of a ministry and they were faithful then. But then something happens. Maybe they got a job and, and their career is just kind of taken over or they have a family. Whatever the case may be, now compromise would describe their life and their faith. And when you talk to people in chair two, if they're brutally honest, if they will get a little bit vulnerable, which is very hard for people in chair two, they would say that they've compromised their relationship with the Lord. When you think of people in chair three, I want you to think of the word complacency. You see, these are the people who are lost. They, they don't know Jesus. Maybe they're atheists or agnostics, which means they don't know what they believe. They could be 20 years of age. They could be 70 years of age. But regardless, when they look at their calendar and they look at their life, they want nothing to do with the spiritual things of God. When they think about church, they maybe like the church. Maybe they're apathetic to church, but they're not involved in church. These people do not see the need for following Jesus as of yet. And they have no plans in following here and now. They may say things like this. One day, maybe I'll consider following Jesus, but today is not that day. 
Uh, so where do you see these three chairs um, in Scripture? They're actually all over Scripture, but I think there's a, a unique section in Scripture in Joshua 24. If you have your Bibles, go to Joshua 24. We're going to read from that together. Let me give you a little background of what's happening. So Joshua is the Lord's commander. He is leading the Lord's army, and so he's following Moses. And now God has asked Joshua to go into the promised land with the nation of Israel and to take city after city. So God has given him victory after victory after victory. You know about the story of Jericho and the walls falling down, the city of Ai, the day where the sun stood still. I mean, there's victory after victory. So Joshua has literally taken the land of Canaan. He is getting settled, and now he's giving this last proclamation to the nation of Israel. He's going to settle as a family. He's got a couple of things he wants to say in front of the nation. So in Joshua 24, that's where we're going to see it. Joshua 24, verse 14, it says this. Joshua speaking to the nation of Israel. He says this, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land you are living. But for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That is a chair one person. Joshua is letting the nation of Israel know, listen, God has given us victory. Now we're going to settle this land and you can serve whoever you want to serve. You can serve the gods of Egypt. You can serve the gods here in the Amorites in the land that you're living. But let me be very clear for me and my household, we are committed. We are going to serve the Lord with all faithfulness. But then you go a couple of chapters over in Judges chapter 2. And you're going to see this. In Judges chapter 2, verse 6, it says this. Watch how people can go from chair 1 right into chair 2. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. And the people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen, notice that word, seen, past tense, all the great things that the Lord has done. So you have Joshua and the elders who are in the seat of committed. They are, commit, they are committed to the Lord. They love the Lord. The elders are all about the Lord. But then all of a sudden, those who outlived him had seen all of the great things the Lord has done. It went past tense. What about all the things that God was doing now? What about the presence that the Lord gives? They're even treating their faith like it's behind them. So the people went from chair one to chair two. And here's, here's what gets really scary. Look at verse 10. After that, a whole generation had been gathered to their fathers and another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So you have Joshua and the elders in chair one, their followers in chair two, the seat of compromise. And then one generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You have in one generation's time a group of people who didn't know about Moses, who didn't know about the Red Sea, who didn't know about 400 years of slavery, who had no idea about the Ten Commandments, who had no idea about Joshua receiving victory after victory after victory. An entire generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You see, people in chair one, they know the Lord personally. People in chair two, they know about the Lord. And people in chair three, they don't even know the Lord. And you don't have to look uh, to just Joshua and his people. I mean, think about King David. King David was a chair one person. In Psalm 23, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm committed to you, Lord. I love you. I will follow you. But his son Solomon, who we've been reading about uh, the past month, he's in chair two, the seat of compromise. Solomon, when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you're going to see that he's continually compromising his relationship with the Lord. And his son Rehoboam, he wanted nothing to do with the Lord. When Solomon would write the book of Proverbs, which we've been studying, he would say things like this, that, that wisdom is found in chair one. Wisdom can be not only knowing the truth, but having the boldness and being courageous enough to live in that truth. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. And he said, the wise walk in the ways of the Lord. But chair two people, that's knowledge. They know about the Lord. They know what they should do, but they don't do it. And then people in chair three, they're more foolish. They want nothing to do with the Lord. 
You don't have to look to Joshua or the Old Testament. You can look right here. We see this all the time in the church where people will go from chair one to chair two to chair three. Maybe you see it in your own life. Maybe you see it in your family's life. How about we put some flesh on these bones? When you think of chair one, I, I want you to think of this phrase. I want you to think of God first. You see, these are the people who keep God first. When they look at their calendar, it's gonna be all about Jesus. When they're looking at what's going on at the church, it's all about Jesus. When they, they're making decisions, it comes back to Jesus. C.S. Lewis wrote this. One thing that Christianity can never be is moderately important. And so for people in chair one, that's how they see their faith. It's not moderately important. It's the most important thing. And so Jesus is number one. Everything else is going to be number two. I'm going to look at my calendar and my finances and my decisions and my life and my time and the way that I serve and how I live. These people are on mission for Jesus because they are keeping God First, they love the Lord. They're going to live for the Lord. They see themselves as ambassadors for Christ in their neighborhood where they live, work, and play. They want to make a difference because God wants to make an impact in them and through them. So everything comes back to God being first. How about chair two? It's not God first. It's more like God and self side by side. There's this battle between God and self. And people in chair two, they're going to change from place to place and from person to person, depending on who they're around. You see, people in chair two, they're chameleons. Uh, they're people who wear masks. And so you may see them at church and they may be happy and throwing high fives to the pastor, but then you see them in your neighborhood and they act completely different. Or maybe you see them at work and the values that they talk about just don't match up. The, these people have this dual allegiance. There's this internal battle that they're fighting between God and self. These are the people that have Christ on the tip of their tongue, but self on the throne of their heart. So there's this fight between God and self. How about chair three? I want you to think of the word self. Now, these people are not selfish, but everything really comes back to them. I mean, so they're going to make their decisions that's really going to reflect kind of where they're at. Uh, they're going to decide where to live. They're going to decide what job they should take. They're going to think about their reputation. They're going to look at their family as an extension of who they are. And so they're going to make the decisions that better themselves. It's going to be maybe climbing the corporate ladder or hanging out with a certain friend group or what I'm going to post online. Everything's going to be asked, how does this benefit me? How do people see this in me? Because they're only thinking about themselves. When you think of chair one, I want you to think of this word. It's the word relationship. You see, these people who sit in chair one, they have a relationship with Jesus. When they talk about their faith, there is this humility and this natural ability to speak because God is present in their life. The people who sit in chair one, they can talk about God and it's not forced and it's natural because they speak to the Lord often. They're studying scripture. They're, they're praying for other people. They are humbly accepting the fact that Jesus loves them. And so they have a relationship with the Lord. Now, for me, I, I wasn't raised in a chair one home, and I didn't become a Christian until the age of 18. So I, I moved to Louisville, uh, Kentucky, and then went to Louisville Bible College and started a youth ministry there that was actually in E-Town. My professor asked me to, to go to the city called E-Town and be, a, be a, um, a pastor there. And so I would drive an hour from Louisville to Elizabethtown, and, and a, a lovely family saw that I was doing this and said, hey, Crockett, because you're driving an hour on Wednesday nights, why don't you come early over for dinner? We'll cook you food. We'll hang out with you. So my wife and I would go over there early and we noticed that the people that sit in chair one, they talk differently. Um, we noticed that their kids and their family, they talked about like how Jesus was right there with them. They talked about how they had this relationship with Jesus and they talked about all the things that God had done, how they're looking in the rearview mirror and they're reminded of God's faithfulness and how, how much they wanted God to do things. And it really blew me away because I wasn't used to people speaking that way, much less living that way. I remember they had this plaque in their house and it said, Jesus Christ is the head of this house, 
the unseen guest at every dinner table, the silent listener to every conversation. See, people in chair one, they love the Lord. They have a relationship with the Lord. They can speak about the Lord because they're walking daily with the Lord. I remember when I sat in chair one. This was many years ago. I was going through this really hard time in my family. And you can imagine when I talk, I use my hands a lot. And so uh, I was driving down the road and I'm praying, which is not safe because I'm taking my hands off the wheel and, you know, I'm listening to worship music and I'm worshiping. And so I'm pretty dangerous when I'm praying and worshiping and driving at the same time. And if you tied my hands down, I probably couldn't preach this message or even have a conversation with you. But I came to this red light and I'm just pouring my heart out to God. I'm talking about the trials and the troubles and the, the issues that's going on with my family. And I'm just, I'm, I'm praising God. I'm listening to this worship song. And I'm probably getting a little bit emotional and tears are coming down. And I hear this pickup truck pull up right beside me at the red light. And I can hear the muffler and how loud it is. And in the midst of my prayers and my tears, I look over and this guy is looking at me like I am insane. He looks at me and points at me and goes, sir, you are crazy, and he drives away. See, people in chair two, they don't understand people in chair one. People in chair one are obsessive. They take their faith probably a little bit too serious. <clears throat> they, they, they maybe seem like extremists. People in chair two don't understand people in chair one. That's because people in chair two, they don't have a relationship they have a religion. You see, it's, it's all about the do's and don'ts, right and wrong, rules and regulations. When they think of Jesus or they think of scripture or they think of the church, they think of this religious ceremony that they have to be a part of. Billy Graham said this, that religion can do more harm than good. It's like a vaccine. You get a little dose of religion, but if you don't cultivate the relationship, it can become a poison. And people who sit in chair two, they're poisoned and they don't even know it. And what's unique about this chair is it's, it's bigger than all of the other chairs. So it encompasses even more people. On, on this side, you're going to have the people who they believe, they have the knowledge of God, but they're not living out their faith. And on this side, you're going to have people who've had experiences with God or maybe with church or things in the past, but they're all in one Seat. And they're all kind of grouped as, as religious people, people who don't want to take next steps in Jesus. And you know what's scary about people in chair two? When they compare themselves, they never compare themselves to people in chair one. They always compare themselves to people in chair three. What's scary about people in chair two is they think they're sold out for Jesus. They think they are absolutely fully devoted followers of Jesus. And so they look to people in chair three and say, well, at least I'm not that person. At least I'm part of some religious organization. At least I have some type of religion, but they never compare themselves to people in chair one. Let me tell you how people in chair two come to church. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the average churchgoer comes to church once every five weeks. So if you are at Devoted City more than once every five weeks, you are part of the core team awesome. It's great to have you. But let me tell you what, if not, someone who sits in chair two, I mean, just think about it. They've had a long week, week at work. They maybe came on Saturday night. They had a couple of drinks on Saturday and then they, they're sleeping in on Sunday and they kind of wake up. The dad wakes up and he starts to wipe the booger out of his eye. I don't know why they call it eye boogers, but they call them eye boogers. And he flicks it out and he says, oh my gosh, we haven't been to church in four or five weeks. Honey, honey, we got to get up. We got to go. We got to go. Get up. We got to go to church. And she's thinking, sweetheart, do I have to? I mean, come on. We, you know, we had a long night last night. What are we talking about? Kids, kids, I, I need you to get ready, get dressed. Come on. And the kids are, they're groggy and they're tired. They were up, way, up too late last night. Come on, get up. And so they're putting on the wrong socks and they're barely brushing their hair, their teeth. We got to go. We got to go. So they're getting dressed. And, and then his wife looks at him and says, honey, do we have to go today? Well, listen, I know we can't, I know we can't make the eight o'clock and we can probably barely make the, you know, the 930. Maybe we'll make the later service. That's the one we'll go to. So, so come on, we got to go. We got to go. They get in the car and the kids are like, hey, dad, can we stop for Bojangles? No, we're not going to Bojangles. We ain't got time for that. Come on, we've got to get to church. And so there's this argument and there's this fighting and 
the wife kind of looks at the husband and says, honey, can you just tone it down a bit? Like, you are a little much right now. I know, I know, I just, I really want to get to church. And he, he pulls into Devoted City and gets in the parking lot. He turns his car off. And he says, okay, kids, listen, we're here at church. We are religious people. I need you to have on your Sunday smiles. We are people of joy. And the kids are thinking, I don't feel a lot of joy. Like, what are we talking about? So get out here, show them your Sunday smiles, and let's show them that we're religious people. They get out of the car, and they're high-fiving people. Oh, what's up, Molly? How's it going? Pastor Roger, great to see you. It's so good to see you. And they come in, and they're going to they're gonna check their kids in. And their kids don't want to go into the, to the children's ministry. They're barely even here. It's hard for them. But they get them in there, and they walk through the back doors, and they sit beside good people like yourselves. And you notice them. Hey, hey, John, so good to see you. How long have you been coming to Devoted City? Oh, I've been coming the last 15 years. Let me tell you what. I've seen this church grow, and I've seen the staff grow, and God's doing some really amazing things. And Donnie, his, he's just grown as an amazing leader. I just, I just love him. It's just been great. Well, have you ever served or have you given to, to our church? I mean, have I served? Are you kidding me? I'm a pillar in this church. I mean, I've, I've served the kids, I've been a greeter, I've been a host, I've been on stage, and given if this church had stained glass, my name would be at the bottom. I'm telling you what, I've given to so many campaigns. Well, wow, John, it sounds like God's done a lot in you and through you. Um, when did you become a follower of Jesus? Oh, 25 years ago, I gave my life to Jesus, and the world hasn't been the same since. Can you see the difference? Can you hear the difference? One lives for Christ, the other lives for others. One is thriving, the other surviving barely. And the people who sit in this chair, it gets comfortable real easy. And it's very easy to make things about me. And not only is this chair bigger than all the other chairs, but here's what's unique about it. It encompasses a lot of people, but when you look behind here, there's things you can't even see. I mean, everything's kind of compartmentalized. Here's their job and here's their family and here's their, here's their hobbies and here's their church life and, and there's their relationship with Jesus. Oh, and there's, well, we can't, we can't tell you about that because if we brought some of these things out, that would take vulnerability and honesty and people in chair two, they're just not ready for that. You see, Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. Not just, not just Lord of uh, your chest or drawers. I mean, he wants to be Lord of your life. And so they're gonna compartmentalize every single thing here and hide things, not only from themselves, but from the Lord and his church. See, people in chair two, they have a religion. People in chair three, they don't know it, but they're in rebellion to God. The people who sit right here in, in chair three, they're rebelling against God. Jesus would say it this way, if you're not for me, you're against me. And, and they wouldn't word it that way, but they kind of look at chair two and one and they think to themselves, listen, I want nothing to do with that. I, I want nothing to do with faith. I want nothing to do with church. And maybe they're, maybe they're angry at, at what the church has become or they're frustrated or maybe they've had a bad experience or they've met a follower of Jesus who have just turned them off. But regardless, they sit in chair three and they want nothing to do with spiritual things. I remember when I met someone in chair three, I was uh, living in Atlanta, Georgia as a student pastor and I'm, I'm flying to Columbus, Ohio to speak at a conference. And as I'm, I'm getting on the plane, I get seated and I'm putting my seatbelt on. And for some reason I'm getting nervous and I never get nervous when I fly. And you can imagine when I get nervous, I'm gonna get a little chatty. And so I start talking to the person beside me and she's telling me that she's an anthropologist and she's going to um, the Ohio State University to speak at a conference on anthropology. And we start talking about family and life. And she makes the statement. She says, Crockett, I just, I just don't understand why anyone could believe in God with all the proof and the science that's out there. Why would anyone put their faith in God? So what's well, funny, it's, I'm going to Columbus, Ohio as well. I'm a pastor and I'm gonna help people take next steps in their faith. She goes, I just don't understand how anyone could believe in God. I said, can I tell you a little bit of my story? She said, sure. So I was raised in Bluefield, West Virginia and I grew up in an alcoholic family. 
very much a chair three family. And I lived my entire life just doing what I wanted to do, making life all about me. And, and that can really take you to some dark places. And so by the age of 16, there's drugs and there's alcohol and there's addiction. And, and I'm carrying a gun to most places and I'm getting in fights in every other place. And at the age of 18, on Monday night, I get in this big fight with all these guys and we beat them up really bad. And then on Friday night, we have this big house party and the guys we beat up on Monday show up on Friday and they start shooting up the house. And I almost get shot. And I remember my friend saying, Crockett, let's go get them. And for the first time in my life, I say no. And I go home and I pray this simple prayer, God, what do you want from me? And it's clear as day. Jesus wants me to follow him. So I go to my church Sunday morning. I give my life to Christ. I get baptized and Jesus rescues me from everything I need rescued from. He changes my destination and changes my eternity. She looks at me from her third chair and she says, wow, you must be a really strong man. And I said, that's where you're wrong. I'm not. I'm weak. I'm easily influenced, but when you follow Jesus, he gives you this spirit of power and he has turned my life around. We continue to have conversations and I finally get the boldness to ask her, listen, what if, what if I'm right and you're wrong? What if? What if Jesus is real and he is God and he died on a cross and he rose from the dead and he holds the keys to death and life and says, you have nothing to fear and I'm right and you're wrong. What are you going to do? She looks at me from her third chair and she says this, Crockett, that is a risk I'm willing to take. And I'm completely dumbfounded on how people in chair three want to roll the dice with eternity. And if you notice, this, this chair is different than the other chairs. It, it's kind of lower to the ground, and when you sit in it, it, it fits me pretty good. Like, it, it really kind of conforms to your body. But here's what's unique about this chair. The longer you sit in it, uh, uh, whew, the harder it is to get out of. Where do you sit? What describes your life, or your faith. Well, how do these people view the Bible? Because the way that you view scripture tells me everything about your faith. You see, people in chair one, they submit to scripture. They see scripture as the 66 books of the mind of God. It gives them like literally the authority of their, their life. It is a lamp into their feet and a light into their path. It is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. So they're gonna read it. They're gonna spend time with it. They're gonna study it. They're gonna live by it. They're gonna make continually the statement, well, the Bible says, therefore, I'm going to follow. Scripture teaches this, so therefore, I'm gonna surrender. People in chair one, they're in this constant state of surrendering their lives to Jesus because of what Scripture says. People in chair two, they don't submit to Scripture. They respect it. I mean, it's a little bit more important than some famous Christian authors. I mean, there's Rick Warren and there's C.S. Lewis, and the Bible's maybe a little bit better than that. But, but when pinned down, when asked, okay, what are you going to do? They're always going to make this phrase. They're going to say, listen, I know the Bible says, but I'm going to do this. I know the Bible teaches, but I want to go this way. I know that I should because what scripture says, but here is what I'm going to do. Dr. Bruce Wilkinson, who wrote this book, Experiencing Spiritual Breakthroughs, where I got a lot of this message, talks about these three chairs, and he talks about how really when you're parenting in these chairs, that chair two people can really, really kind of confuse their kids when it comes to that. So he found out in his research that chair one parents typically raise chair one children. I mean, there's always outliers. There's, there's gonna be kids who make their own decisions and, and go their own way. But typically on average, chair one parents are going to raise chair one children. He said what surprised him and what he didn't know is that chair two parents very rarely ever raise chair two children. They raise chair three children. Because the kids look at this chair of compromise of, of this consistent internal battle of this fight. And they say, I want nothing to do with this. 
So I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to go this direction because I want nothing to do with the sit in this chair. You see, how you view scripture tells us everything about what you believe and how you surrender to God. And if you have the guts and your kids are listening to this message, ask them where you sit. Maybe you listen to this message online together as a family and you literally ask your kids, regardless of age, hey, when you see my life, where do you see me sitting? Chair three people, they don't respect the Bible. They maybe own a Bible, maybe. And if they do, it's one of these big mamas. <laughs> and so when you open it up, I mean, you're gonna see, oh, wow, there's, a, there's a Papa's yeah, obituary, okay, great. And, and here's, oh, there's $10, jackpot, didn't know that was in there. There's a marriage license. Wow, yeah, great. I remember when the funeral home gave us this. This is awesome. Um, but it's never consulted. It's never read. It just sits maybe out in public or maybe in a closet collecting dust. So maybe they own a Bible. The way that you view scripture tells me everything about your faith. I mean, think about your job. You see, chair one people, they see it as a calling. Chair two people, they see it as a blessing. Chair three people, they see it as a proving ground. How about your marriage? Chair one people, they see it as a covenant. This is a promise that I've made in front of an audience, in front of God, that I'm gonna be faithful until death. Chair two, well, it's a conditional contract. You know, if things don't work out, we could get divorced. If you don't meet my expectations, I could find someone else. Chair three people, they see it as a convenience. How about parenting? Chair, chair one people, they wanna raise godly kids. Chair two people, they wanna raise good kids. Chair three people, they wanna raise successful kids. I heard about a church who was having a child dedication and little Johnny was very upset after the child dedication. They got in the car and Johnny's in the back seat. And he's crying. He's, he's, just, he's just crying. He says, Dad, I just, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And so the dad's like, Johnny, what's wrong? What's wrong? I'm just, I'm so upset. It's because what that preacher said is what that preacher said. What the preacher say? That preacher said that I should be raised in a Christian home, but I want to stay here with you guys. <laughs> a lot of truth in that. Where do you sit? What describes your life, your faith, your parenting? See, this invitation applies to every single person in this room. If you're in chair one, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know what, Crockett, I am so glad you're having this message. I've got some neighbors that are here, and my life group is here, and they really need to take some next steps. I'm so glad you're having this message. If you're thinking that, you're probably not in chair one, you're probably in chair two. <laughs> but if you are in chair one, I would love for you to reaffirm your relationship with Jesus. I would love for you to humbly accept the fact that Jesus sees us as broken, as flawed and loves us anyway. And that you would humbly step into what you already know to be true, that he chooses you, that he loves you, that he is worthy of mercy and worthy of following. And so I, I pray that as in chair one, that you would make Luke 9, 23, I mean, your theme verse, I will deny myself I will take up my cross and I will follow you. I will humbly accept that you love me, that you've called me, that you've forgiven me, that you've rescued me, that you've changed me, that you've sent me on mission and given me purpose and you've given me this life and life to the full. I'm gonna reaffirm daily that God, you are good and that I'm not and that I need you. No one needs the gospel more than me. That is a chair one mentality. So today, if you're in chair one, I would ask that you would reaffirm your relationship with Jesus. If you're in chair two, I would ask that you would repent. The word repent is the Greek word metanoia, which generals would stand before their armies and they would say, repent, and they would about face, they would turn. And God is calling his church and his people to turn away from this world and to run into the loving arms of a savior. To not worry about the, the tasks, the proving grounds, what other people think 
and run strictly to the arms of the Savior who will welcome you home. You see, I've talked a lot about chair two because I've sat in this chair for a very long time, longer than I'm comfortable for you knowing. So I feel like this chair is familiar to me. There's a scripture that's tailor-made for this chair. It's Revelation 3, 16. It's where Jesus is speaking to the church in Asia. And he says, I know your deeds, neither cold or hot. I wish you were one or the other, but because you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm describes a chair to person. And what we have to understand is that a lukewarm person, it disgusts not only God, but it should disgust us. And so today, if you're in chair two, I'm praying that you would have the boldness, that you would be courageous enough to get up and to move into chair one. Or maybe you're in chair three. I know what you're thinking. Oh, Crockett, I know what you're going to ask me. You're going to ask me to go from chair three all the way to chair two, to cross that line of faith. Crockett, you're going to want me to make that decision to place my faith in Jesus and to go into chair two. I'm going to ask that you would not do that. Skip over the chair of hypocrisy. Skip over the chair that wears mask and that looks like a chameleon. Today, if you're in chair three, I would ask that you would receive the good news of Jesus. Today, maybe this is your first time here or you're watching online or maybe you're at the Cary campus and you're thinking, could it be this good? Is this for real? And the answer is yes. And I'm asking you to say yes to Jesus and watch what happens. He's gonna forgive and he's going to love and he's gonna change everything that you've ever known from the inside out. And your life is gonna go to places and you're gonna do things you could never, ever imagine. I mean, never in a million years would I think I would be in Raleigh, North Carolina, speaking to you beautiful people about the goodness of God. But look at what God does. This is what God does. I mean, we've had, I think, 140 baptisms in less than a year. Let's make it 141, 145, 200, because you have said yes to Jesus. I'm asking and praying that the Spirit of God would help us to be a courageous church and to step into chair one and be fully committed and to keep God first and to have this relationship and submit to the authority of scripture and to reaffirm continually our relationship with the Lord and watch what God does. He'll change your church, he'll change your city, your neighborhood, your work, and more importantly, he will change you. I can't wait to see what God does next. So if you're at the Cary campus or you're here live, there's gonna be people right here down front that want to pray for you, that wanna have that conversation about next steps. Maybe you have something you need to talk about. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need prayer or you need to confess something. Don't let anything hold you back from receiving and saying yes to the goodness and grace of God. Will you pray with me? Father, I know this can be a very difficult message, but an eye-opening message. And God, I pray that you would give us the spirit of power, that you would remove any fear or any doubt that we would have, and that you would give us the boldness and the bravery to stand up and to say, Lord, I want everything that you offer. I want your spirit to be poured out in me. I want to make a difference. I want to be forgiven. I don't want to hold on to this guilt or this shame or this pain. I want you to cleanse not only my soul, but my conscience. And God, I want you to set me free. May we at Devoted City Church be a church that is set free and live free and be free. In the name of Jesus, help us to have the conversations and pray the prayers and be baptized or to go into our city and all the places we live, work, and play and represent you and your grace and your mercy. But Lord, let us experience it here and now in the name of Christ, whom we love and we serve and we say amen and amen.